Jubilis Pinelis. Thank you very much for the introduction and uh, the invitation to be here. I'm quite happy to be here. What is half a century? This is Wikimedia's view of half a century from the 1970s until today. Unix has had a similar history behind it, so it's becoming 50 years in a couple of uh, years. It has seen a similar rate of change such as the one we saw. So what I will present here is an overview of the Unix history in the way I have come to realize it by building a repository which you can download from uh, GitHub of the complete uh, artifacts that we have up to now, complete timeline from the inception of Unix until today. So I will describe what you will find in the repository, how it was created, and lessons that can be drawn from it in, this, in what uh, happens, how programming practices evolve, and how the architecture of the system has evolved over the years. Unix uh, started its uh, life with Thompson and Ritchie, so you see them here programming on a PDP-11 through a tele-typewriter in the 1970s, and then it went to Berkeley. You see here Bill Joy and his computer uh, research group at uh, Berkeley, and people programming on uh, in modern open source communities. And this life started uh, at the Bell Laboratories, a famous place uh, of where many fantastic inventions happened, including eight Nobel Prizes, three Turing Awards, then inventions such as radioastronomy and cosmic radiation, undersea cables, the transistor, the charged cable devices that we have all in our phones and cameras, uh, the theory of communication, lasers, solar cell panels, the C, C++, and OC programming languages, fiber optics, TDMA and CDMA multiplexing. So all those wonderful things came out of Bell Labs and, of course, Unix. Unix started its life through a failure. What was this failure? In the 1960s, the Massachusetts Institute of Technology, AT&T, Bell Labs, and General Electric banded together to create a wonderful operating system with the name of Multix. It was very influential, but overambitious. So it didn't, was not progressing as it should have been. It was modern with its complexity. So at some point, uh, AT&T Bell Labs decided to move away from the project. So Ken Thompson, Dennis Ritchie, Doug McIlroy, and Joe Osana found themselves out of the project without a way to do operating system research. And they went on to develop an unnamed at the time C operating system on a PDP-7, a very primitive computer compared to the General Electric one. It had some key ideas in it that they found to be uh, quite powerful. So they went off and created a funding proposal for the PDP-11 computer, which was more powerful. And the justification for that proposal was actually to create a word processing system. Bell Labs was dealing with patents, so they said, why not, we'll build you a system to write the patents more efficiently. The history of what followed was quite long and uh, complex, as you can see from this uh, tree. The reason Unix is uh, important is uh, for several uh, key reasons. First of all, it's exemplar design, the technical contributions, I will explain that. Its impact, its development model, we'll go more into that. Its widespread use, probably most of the devices here are running some for sort of either Unix or a uh, system based on its ideas. And in the words of Doug McIlroy, it's unusual simplicity, power, and elegance. I found these things evident even at the first PDP-7 incarnation of that unnamed system. As a recognition for these ach achievements, the two developers, the key, key, key developers behind it, have received the President's Medal, quite an honor in the United States. In terms of system technology, Unix has uh, popularized or brought to us things like a hierarchical file system. For example, IBM system at the time gave you several disks, virtual disks where you can store things, not a hierarchy. Compatible input output for files, devices, nowadays networking, and in the process I.O. The pipes and filters architecture, virtual file systems, and the shell as a user selectable process, not something that's given to you by the operating system, but something that you can build and select, and this has spurred innovation. Also, a number of other technologies were part of uh, Unix and popularized by it, such as C and C++, the parser and lexical analyzer generators, Lex and uh, Yak, software development environments, document preparation tools, uh, scripting languages, TCP IP networking, the stack that was developed at Berkeley is used in many devices uh, even uh, today, and configuration management systems. 
How did I get hold of uh, those ancient source code in a way that could be put into GitHub? Keep in mind that AT&T, although it at the beginning it was not able to sell its technology because of a consent degree that limited its uh, field of operation to telephony and not, say, computer technology, uh, it still maintained copyright over all the early editions. Thankfully, uh, uh, in early in the 2000s, Caldera, who at the time were owners of intel the intellectual property behind Unix, released uh, this letter that you see, where it said that if that we give you the permission to use this code for non-commercial properties pro uh, processes, it's not open source, but it's close enough to be able to to put it in a repository and upload it to GitHub. Based on the availability of that uh, key material, I decided it would be quite cool to create a repository recording all the history and evolution of Unix. So my motivation for that was to explore programming style. I will get in more into that later. Consolidate digital artifacts of historical importance. Collect and, re and record history that's fading away so the people behind that are getting older. Some of them are uh, unfortunately no longer with us and also provide a data set that anyone can use for digital archaeology and repository mining. So things you can uh, take away is this uh, repository. It's 1.1 gigabyte, recording a complete lifeline of Unix from 1970 until today. It's, uh, the this contains also documentation and authorship details for parts that were not recorded at the time, but I was able to deduce by reading manual pages, documentation, and so on. It's an open source project, so if you want to contribute to how the repository is created, you can go to the corresponding project and contribute to changes and uh, additions. Some techniques on how you can use tools for importing Git snapshots. Maybe you have old parts in uh, your organization, old source code that you want to bring into Git and uh, perhaps GitHub. And also lessons and ideas for empirical studies. So let me give you some uh, numbers. The repository starts its life in uh, June 1970 with just 43 files and 11,000 lines and uh, ends at uh, several million lines, 27 million uh, lines with a, uh, num almost half a million commits. I have on the other column uh, what would be the history of Linux in one repository. There are more mergers, for example, and uh, more authors, but there are quite more days of activity in the history of uh, Unix. This repository contains the research edition of Unix, so things that came out of Bell Labs, PDP-7, the first edition, all editions up to the seventh edition, a port that was made to the VAX computer, 32V, the editions that came out of Berkeley, 386 BSD, the two editions that were developed by Bill uh, and Lynn Jollitz, and then FreeBSD from 1.0 until today. And for all those who have tags, you have the contributors, you have branches and merges. This is a tree of what you get. So you see a linear sequence here on the research editions, things that came out of Bell Labs. At some point, we start to get Berkeley releases. You see here a first merge, B BSD3, the Berkeley uh, distribution uh, 3.0, uh, uh, had parts from BSD2 and also from Unix 32V, and then a series of Berkeley release releases. These are all taken out of from snapshots. They were not using at the beginning, any source control system. But at Berkeley, they started using uh, an old source control system called SCCS. And from that point, we have also direct commits inherited from SCCS. Then are parts that are open source, including 386 BSD, the net network releases that came out of Berkeley, and then FreeBSD through its CVS and modern Git mirror. So what are these uh, research editions? So the first the, the, the edition that is available, the PDP-7 edition, survived just as a printed kernel of uh, printout of the kernel and some utilities. This the computer it was developed on. And this is what survived. It's not available in digital form, but someone in an attic found some printouts. You see they are badly printed with scribbled notes on them, probably by Ken Thompson or Dennis Ritchie. And a group of volunteers uh, led by uh, Warren Toomey in Australia worked uh, from around the world, worked and typed them all in. And then in order to prove that these were indeed correct, they ran the result on a PDP-7 emulator. And amazingly, the thing ran, booted, and gave them a prompt. <laughs> the first edition, that's the first formal edition of something that was named 
Uh, Unix is a PDP-11 kernel on a PDP-11 processor, a machine such as uh, this one. Again, it has not survived in digital form. This is a lesson for all of us. It has survived in a slightly better condition as a an attachment to a memo that was distributed at the Bell Labs in 1972. You see here the formal formalities of a large research laboratory. And we have things like that. Here is the code that initializes the inodes, information nodes for special files. These are definitions for the various devices. So you see things like a punch tape and a deck tape and, uh, and things like uh, that. And th also documentation that was quite important from the beginning. This is handwritten, but you see here the documentation for the fork system call. F the second edition has survived in a worse form, in digital form, but in a worse form, only a few fragments on a disk without the metadata. So again, volunteers work together in order to piece them together as we piece together DNA sequences. We don't know which bits belong to which file, so they try to guess how they fit together and how they, they could be spliced together. We also have the manual. Let me go here through the table of uh, contents. You see the first uh, section of the manual has all the com user commands and uh, the commands that can be run by users, and you see there are many of them that we still have fine today, such as echo and date and cut and uh, the C compiler and uh, so on. We have the system calls, and quite a number of them have survived until today. We have the subroutines, the beginnings of a library, the special files, file formats, and also something very interesting, user-maintained programs. This is the stuff that ended up in the slash USR directory. Because as I said, people there were quite, imp quite uh, strict about documentation. In order to force people to write documentation for the files they dumped in slash USR bin, they created a small cron script, a script that ran periodically, that went and removed all commands for which there was no documentation. So you see a primitive form of uh, social control and various miscellaneous files. Then we have the third edition, the fourth and the fifth. The uh, third is significant because it was mainly written in C. The fourth has survived only as the tier of manual source code. For the fifth, we have the, the code, but not the manual source. And the sixth is complete. It was important, it was the, used as a, a lecture notes by John Lyons in Australia to create a course based on the Unix kernel source code. This was illegal for a long period of time, so it was widely photocopied as a Samistad document. Then it went to Berkeley, and a number of releases came out from there. Uh, there was a port before Berkeley to the VAX 32-bit architecture. And the Berkeley snapshots added things such as real virtual memory through a fund from uh, DARPA, email, and uh, signal handling, TCP IP networking, very important, performance improvements, the uh, name daemon, and at some point, people at Berkeley realized they had so much code that they had written there under government contracts, which by law in the United States are in the public uh, domain, that they could distribute quite a substantial part without AT&T licensing. So these were the so-called net distributions. Two people then, Bill and Lynn Jolitz, decided to get those parts, add the things that were missing, and they created a system that could run on a 386 computer, uh, the 386 BSD as it was uh, called. They weren't so good as uh, Linus Torvalds in creating a community, so people started creating patches for those releases because they were at some point dragging their feet in creating the new releases. And this at some point became FreeBSD and other BSD systems such as NetBSD and OpenBSD. <laughs> so you can see here a timeline of what's in the repository. All these things are created from snapshots. We don't have specific commits. At Berkeley, I have interspersed the CCS commits with the snapshots, and from here on, we have actual commits from the version control system used. This is the increase in the source code, the size of the kernel, so it, you see it has increased 1,000-fold from the 1970s until today, from uh, less than uh, 10,000 lines to a few million lines today. What we'll find in the repository are the dates of what has been released, the authors, and also the parents of each commit. Let me show you some commits in order to give you an idea. These were commits that were written in a teletypewriter, things that were used to send telegrams. Because they were digital, they were also used to hook up, hook up computers as terminals. So you typed here and you saw the result here. It only supported uppercase characters, 
So lowercase was uppercase and real uppercase was preceded by a backslash. So you can see here Ken Thompson doing some work on the sleep routine in the kernel. We know it's Ken Thompson because it's in the Ken directory. Then it's Richard doing work on the KL device driver. Again, it's DMR, so we know it's uh, Dennis Ritchie. Uh, Brian Kernighan working on RAT4. Again, we know that this is the author of RAT4. That's why I attributed this to him. And Stephen Byrne, of course, working on the Bourne shell. Later commits that happened to Berkeley used the more advanced terminal, the famous uh, VT100. And you can see here Bill Joy, the founder of Sun Microsystems, working on some networking stuff, and uh, also Eric Schmidt, the executive chairman of Alphabet, uh, Google's company, working on the NetCP command as students, of course, at that time. Also a very infam famous or infamous commit is this by, um, you see uh, here, Eric Allman working on send mail. He's adding the, the, the debug command, which was used a few years later by the first internet worm. So it, was, uh, it took advantage of this command in order to spread throughout the internet. Here you see that uh, git blame works correctly, so it can attribute parts of the code in, diff in the same file to different authors spanning more than 10 years in time, in 1980, 1979, 1975. People often ask me, what is the oldest part of the code that has survived until today? I run git blame, it takes a long time, more than three days, on all files of all the system following back parents and so on. And this is the part I found in the modern FreeBSD timezone.c file. There are still parts that were written by Dennis Ritchie in 1979. So I think that's uh, quite impressive that if you do git blame on that file, you can see that. You see here how code evolves and is added between various releases. To create that, I took things like snapshots from uh, the web, from CDs, version control systems. I created a build script, and I also added author uh, the author names and even their emails. So if you look at GitHub, you can see sometimes the names of the, of the authors posted correctly. I created an in-memoriam ac account from the for the late Dennis Ritchie and uh, Jeff Osana. Ken Thompson actually is still active and has a GitHub account, and he was kind enough to match his then email address to his current account, so you can see this, his commits here. The import creates a so-called git fast import file that imports all the files. Based on this, I thought what I can do for research, I have some ideas here of things that can be done, so study evolution or the uh, uh, organizational culture or how program individual programmers work and uh, so on. Wanted, uh, wanted to study uh, at the beginning was based on this code, which is the source code of edge.c. When I first saw it, I thought, what's going on here? This was programmed by my heroes. And as you see, there are th tens of global variables, no comments, or just one comment, editor. And I thought, something must be wrong here. But then I reasoned that people were programming in this device rather than on a GUI editor. And maybe it made sense to program with using short identifiers. So I said that to look out on how modularity, new language features, the compilers, code formatting practices, and software complexity and code readability evolved through the years. So looking at programming practices, the evolution of programming practices, by looking throughout the years, I found that the file length has increased because perhaps you have faster terminals. The functionality has also increased. The line length has uh, increased. The identifier length has increased, so we write better identifiers nowadays. Uh, also, the mean function length has uh, increased. So if we look at uh, modularity, we see that we nowadays use more static declarations. The static declarations went up. The number of include directives also went up to import library modules. And if we look at programming languages, we see that we nowadays use const more, enumeration declarations, and inline went up and down because it was sort of supported by compilers and people used uh, other keywords in order instead of inline. Um, void was uh, also used increasingly and uh, volatile started being used when it became available. Regarding compiler technology, something is very interesting. At the beginning, people used the register keyword in order to say which variables would end up in uh, registers. Nowadays, as you see, we no longer use that. It has fallen, it has been disused. 
because we trust the compiler to do a much better job than uh, human intuition. Regarding formatting practices, I don't know if you uh, can guess what language this is. Any ideas? <laughs> it's the C programming language with some macros written by Stephen Burns, the source code of the Born shell, to make it look like Algol because Stephen Burns was one of the people involved in the Algol language and he liked this style of programming. You still see that in the shell. Uh, we nowadays don't program in this way. We don't invent our own macros to change C into something else. So I had the idea that we converge to a standard. And in, in, indeed, I have found that we have f less inconsistency in how the way we program. Uh, w we have uh, converged into the use of indentation spaces and so on. Regarding complexity, I found the picture mixed. So it goes up and down in terms of mean lines per function, in terms of statement nesting in terms of preprocessor conditionals and so on. So people became cocky, I think, and some point th said, this is crazy, we must uh, limit uh, ourselves and uh, become more constrained. It's something also similar to GoTo, which was considered harmful in the 19, late 1960s, and you see that became used less and less, and some point people said, okay, it's not that bad, maybe we can use it in a few constrained words. Finally, regarding readability, we see that we the number of indentation spaces uh, converges to six, so something between eight and four. Statements per line decrease. The comment character density increased, but then fell again, and so on. If we look at professionalism, I looked at various words that people use in source code, perhaps in times of agony or frustration. <laughs> I hope we're not uh, videotaping this. And uh, I found that it became it be, it was used increasingly, and some point started decreasing again. Perhaps people, more professional people, rather than students, started contributing to the code. Now let me look uh, at the other part: how architecture evolves. What I was uh, surprised to see was that even in the PDP-7 architecture uh, system, the system had a very uh, the markings of an architecture. So it had a layering between a differ uh, differentiation between the kernel and the user space, it had partitioning, it had a system call interface, it had code and data scoping, it even had parts written in an interpreter. By the first uh, edition, it had a reference architecture, so parts of the system call were used again. 34 system calls got uh, were there, 18 were common with the PDP-7 version, and amazingly, another set of 18 are still used today, 50 years later. There was a binary code API from different languages, Fortran and C, you could use the same system calls. IO was abstracted, devices could be used as files. The second edition, we had user contributed code, the shell was there as a user program, and there were documented file programs that some programs there read and others wrote. The third edition, we had the pipe abstraction that's used uh, widely used today, and all tools that received input and output were rewritten to become filters. They were not as like that from the beginning, they were rewritten. The fourth edition, we had the system uh, rewritten in C, structured programming, an API that's language independent, structured definitions, and so on. If you look at uh, the commands, I went to and measured and counted the number of commands. You have can find another repository on GitHub that has the number of commands that are available on each version of Unix. So here you see the system calls, and you see when each system call was introduced and when it stopped being used for all versions that are available in the repository. And we see an increase in the number of user commands, in the number of system calls, in the number of C library functions. At some point, people were shy, but then they started putting everything under the sun as a library function. And in the number of devices, something we can expect, file formats, uh, system commands, and also documented kernel interfaces. Look here, this is the architecture of the system of the first research edition. You see that we have user space with the user programs and the administration programs, the library in assembly language and the B language, no C there at the time, the kernel space system call interface, the IO subsystem, pro process control system, and some utility functions. Now squint your eyes and look again at the architecture of modern FreeBSD 11.0. Okay, this is the one, this is 50 years later. You see that the major parts of the architecture are still here 
and the system is roughly following the same rough architecture, although major innovations have happened at that time. So we see that architecture, that as it happened at the beginning, was put into stone and is with us still today. So, as uh, action items, what uh, do I want you to leave here today? You can use this repository for learning, so you can see all the editions and learn about them, and also if you do research, do research with it. I, w I invite you to improve it, so you can add more authorship information, about 50% <coughs> of the files are attributed to authors, many are not. You can uh, merge other concurrent C CCS and CVS commits so that happened. There was a line of two uh, BSD releases that are not yet there. You can add them. You can add new research editions that a few months ago were released into the public, so 8 to 10 and plan 9. If you have powerful friends, you can lobby with them to release uh, later editions of the Unix source code, such as the System 5, which is very influential and will allow us to build another timeline down to open Solaris. And also, if you work with uh, Git, you can work to improve Git's performance and accuracy so that it doesn't take three days to tell you which are the oldest lines in the system. With that, I thank you for your attention.